So I'm Ard Louis, Professor of Theoretical Physics here at the University of Oxford. I work mainly on biological physics, which means I apply concepts or techniques from physics to try to understand what life is, what biology is, what, what makes life so special and so interesting. And I'm really pleased to be joined today by George Ellis. George is a professor um, at the University of Cape Town, a very famous cosmologist. He's visiting us here at the University of Oxford. Um, George has also done a lot of work in philosophy on theories of top-down causation and emergence. Um, he's actually been pushing the community to clarify the distinction between science and philosophy when they're talking about multi multiple universes and cosmology. And uh, so the right kind of person, I think, to talk about these big questions. And uh, um, so it's very pleased that he's able to come here and he's visiting the University of Oxford at the moment, which is why we're taking advantage of having him here to discuss big questions like fine tuning, yeah. of which, on which you've written a lot of things, George. Uh, not so much on fine tuning. I've written a lot on philosophy of cosmology and emergence of downward That's right. causation. That's right, yeah. You have a big book coming out on emergence. Right? I have a big book coming out on downward causation um, in which emergence will feature, but the focus is on the fact that a common view that all causation is upwards from the bottom level, the atomic level, through chemistry to psychology and society, that that is a part of the truth, but it isn't the whole truth, and that a lot of, the, a lot of what is also going on is downward causation from society to our brains to our bodies to electrons in our muscles and so there's a down causation as well as upward causation. So what would be an example of downward causation? Uh, we're t speaking English. Now why are we speaking English? It's because we were brought up in societies in which English was the language and that has got embedded in our neurons and is controlling the way that electrons flow in our in, in, the electrons flow in our neurons and so that's downward causation from society into the level of electrons in our brains. It's a, then okay. there's a growing literature on the social neuroscience which mm -hmm. talks about this kind of thing. So the point is that there are, there is the world of English language with its rules, yeah. which is an emergent level, and that is having in our brains at the moment downward causation yeah. to our brains. And so in my case I'm also speak, I was brought up speaking Dutch. So the English is sometimes translated into Dutch and then okay. translated down. So there's another level of um, yeah. confusion. I mean, I was going to downward causation, not just confusion. And then, do, why do you think this has been under um, appreciated? Um, reductionism has been a one extraordinary success, and 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 um, in the past hundred years or so. Firstly, um, the discovery. The chemistry used to be the great um, emergent phenomenon that it was supposed you couldn't explain how do hydrogen and oxygen come to give you water, how do sodium and chloride come to give you salt. But this was explained through quantum physics by Linus Pauling and, uh, and others in uh, last century. It's an outcome of quantum physics and the Pauli exclusion principle. So that was a wonderful success. And then the, the, the next big one was um, Crick and Watson and the, the molecular biology revolution that we could explain hereditary in terms of molecules fitting together and particularly DNA with the base pairs and so on. The incredible success of reductionism has been that one could explain chemistry in terms of quantum physics and so you could explain how uh, sodium and chlorine filled fit together to give you salt, which is completely different. It's emergence of a completely different type of property out of two poisonous elements. <laughs> and then um, that, that was the first one. And then it was the molecular biology revolution where one came to understand that underlying living beings is, is this molecular structure and, and the way that um, heredity is based in DNA with these base pairs uh, and, and, and the coding, the famous genetic coding, but much, much more than that, the way that molecular shapes, um, molecules have got three-dimensional shapes and it's actually the shapes which control biological function. And then the third one was the brain and the understanding that uh, brains are controlled by neurons with currents flowing down from uh, the dendrons to the nuclei to the axons according to very well-established equations. And so you were, you, you were explaining 
a huge amount of what was going in, in bottom-up kinds of ways. And then the question was, well, was there anything left for a top-down causation to do? No, I just... So the idea of emergence is, for example, if you have one water molecule, it's not wet. You have two, it's not wet. Three, it's not wet. Yeah. But you put enough of them together, then they may exhibit the property of wetness. Yeah, right. And what's interesting about that property of wetness, so here, is that I can, in fact, probably derive it from the details of the water molecules and put a lot of them on a computer yeah. and calculate it. Yeah. But in fact, it doesn't have to be water to be wet. It could be ammonia or any other property. Yeah. So wetness has this kind of many to one Yes. Redundancy. Many different types of microscopic instantiations can give me this property of wetness. Yes, but but that's 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 weak emergence, and okay. in, in fact, it's very difficult, as you as you know, to f deduce the properties of water from the properties of the atom. But but strong emergence. I think my favourite example at the present time is a digital computer, and we're all familiar with digital computers. And so you've got this machine sitting there, and it's got all of these gates wired together to make integrated circuits. It's got a keyboard and a screen and so on. And the thing about it is that that machine does nothing until you load a program in it, okay? So now you load the program and you type it in and, and then you type in your data and it appears on the screen. Now what is happening there? And what is happening there is that the program is acting down to tell the electrons what to do. And what I mean by that is if you load in a word processing program and then type in some data, different things will happen at the bottom level than if you put in a picture processing program or a music processing program or something like that. And so exactly the same physics, exactly the same hardware gives you completely different results depending on the program. Now, the question is what is the ontological nature of the program? What's its What's its essence? Is it a physical thing or is it an abstract thing? Is it a mental thing? And actually, a program is an abstract thing. Um, uh, now, at first, the reductions say it's nothing but the, the excitations in the states at the bottom level. But the thing is, you type the program in at the top level in some high-level language, maybe Fortran, and it gets down, it gets reinterpreted at a lower level, maybe Java, at a lower level in assembly language, at a lower level machine code. Exactly the same logical structure gets reinterpreted all the way down and exactly the same logic then in the end gets implemented in terms of electrons flowing to gates. And the level of ca the causation has taken place from the top level where you entered all the way down. And what is the machinery by which it happens? It happens via compilers yeah. and interpreters, which are, which are incredible things, which specifically act top down from each level in the hierarchy of abstract machines down to the level of the gates. And I think it's a wonderful example of top down causation. Yeah. And of course, I, you could have the same program running on a Mac or on yes. a PC or on a mainframe. That, that is right. So it's exactly what you said. There's multiple ways it can do, and you can use different different kinds of programs at the different level. At the bottom level, you can diff use different um, processes with different microcoding, and they will give you exactly the same output because you've told them to do it, and it's a top level which is deciding what will happen at the bottom levels. There can be many different ways it will happen at the bottom level, and they all give the same high-level output in a reliable way. So none of this is very controversial, right? <laughs> it's all kind of obvious. So why did you feel the need to write about this in a book? Well, because a lot of people deny it. <laughs> right, okay. And what do they deny? Um, let, let, let's take a, a simple case. The question is, as we're talking to each other, was, is what we are saying to each other an inevitable outcome of what was written into the beginning of the universe? <laughs> now, I had an interchange with a very, very bright woman about this physicist um, a couple of months ago in which she was, I was talking about emergence and top-down causation and she said, I don't believe any of it, it's all bottom-up. And so I challenged her and I said, do you believe that what you are saying was written into the initial date of the universe? And she said, yes, in which case I was gobsmacked. How can any, anybody believe that? Now, there, there's a great many problems with this. The one particular one is quantum uncertainty, that what happened way down there at the beginning of the universe has got altered by quantum uncertainty at many times since then. And let's take one specific one. If you knew everything about what was happening on the surface of the Earth uh, 
two billion years ago, you couldn't predict that we would exist today because cosmic rays were coming in and they were changing the DNA and they changed evolutionary outcomes. Now, the emergence of a cosmic ray is subject to quantum uncertainty. In other words, if you know that there's an excited atom there at a particular time, physics cannot tell you when it will emit an, uh, a photon, in what direction it'll go. And so, and so it's completely unpredictable, not just in practice, but in principle, what damage will be caused to DNA during during the course of evolutionary history and so therefore the fact that I even that I would be here is not written into the initial conditions of the universe. Supposing we um, <laughs> ignore that problem, let's, let's, let's forget that quantum physics exists and somehow my interlocutor said I don't believe in quantum uncertainty which is extraordinary but anyhow, supposing that wasn't true, in that case something would have had to have written into the last scattering surface in the beginning of the universe the speech that I'm making to you, they would have had to written in the fact that um, Edward Witten would discover string theory, that Einstein would discover um, special relativity, the Battle of Waterloo, um, Wordsworth sonnets, they would all have, have to have been written in it. That is so mind-bogglingly nonsense. Yeah. <laughs> um, if, if that was to happen, there would have been, apart from all of the physical impossibilities, some demi-urge would have had to be at work putting that in. It's a far worse, <laughs> it's a far Always interpretation of causality the, 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 um, the, 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 than anything I can imagine. And so what actually has happened is that genuine emergence has taken place. Your mind and my mind have come into existence. They've come into existence with <coughs> higher order powers, Einstein's brain come in, with powers of logic at the higher level. And that logic at the higher level has causal powers in terms of... Um, in terms of making logical arguments, coming to conclusions, writing them down, constructing engineering, which is an output of all of this, all takes place at the higher level. It is enabled by the underlying flow of electrons in the brain, but how? Because your thoughts tell which electrons to go, and that comes back up and shapes the next one. It's a, it's a circular loop there. And if you ask yourself, how can it be that there is higher level thought which makes logical sense, comes to logical yeah. conclusions, it can only be if the brain emerges in such a way that it has the capacity to have that logical thought quite independent of the underlying physics. Now this is of course reminiscent of the way that Alan Turing taught us that digital computers can be uh, realized in any substrate, whatever. You can do them with water machines, you can do them hydraulically or electrically or electronically, you can do them mechanically, uh, and they will all give you exactly the same output. It's, it's what you said, it's this key thing, that the higher level logic can be interpreted in many ways downstairs realized in many ways but the logic has its own way it's, it's it's its own causal structure which will proceed and which gives physical outcomes in the real world like we are all driving in motor cars which were created nowadays by electronic computers working in a top-down way and making them and so abstract logic has yes, causal powers power. and so what you're reacting against is a kind of extreme physicalist position which yeah. says that there's nothing but atoms and molecules yes. period yes. Yes. And, and 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 that you're almost giving a kind of reduction reduction ad absurdum argument saying yes. that correct it, it leads to absurd impossibilities yes. and it must be wrong yeah and then if i understand you right what you're saying is one of the key points is that or when you get to the point that we have conscious minds yeah. we tap into a world of logic yes which pre-existed or exist separately from the, the physical ah, world, yes. possibly. Yeah? Yes. And, so, and it's that it's that tapping into that logical world which then has has a strong influence and yes. a strong downward causation that changes things yes. in radical so, ways. So this is where philosophers and math working mathematicians tend to disagree with us. Any working mathematician exploring mathematical structures, exploring differential equations, algebraic structures, feels as if they're exploring a landscape which exists there independent of the human mind. And for instance, the early Greeks discovered that the square root of two was irrational. Now, one of the things of, of real discovery is you find out things you did not want to discover. The Greeks wanted to discover a ratio, and they found they couldn't create one, and that was a great shock to their system. It was something they did not want to find. And that is the mark of a discovery 
of not creating things, not inventing things, but of discovering things. And so every mathematician throughout the universe will discover the square root of two is irrational, and because that is a mathematical, timeless, eternal, unchanging fact. So I call that a platonic reality. Now, if you don't like the word platonic reality, you can use some other phrase for it. But um, the point then is there are other ones like the value of the number pi, 3.141592635 etc etc which has outcomes the human mind discovers that value it uses it in engineering design chemical engineering physical engineering and it has outcomes in the world in terms of stuff and so the abstract logical structure in these platonic spaces is discovered by the human mind goes down to electrons in our hands which make us shape things and has causal effects in the real world so what I'm trying to still get a little bit is what it is that you're reacting against because somehow all of this seems so reasonable that how could yeah. any reasonable person disagree? <laughs> um, but I think what you're reacting against is a kind of nothing buttery that happens. Yes. Yeah, so, so we say that um, uh, human beings are made of chemicals. Humans are nothing but chemical machines. Or our brains are made of neurons. Humans are nothing but neurons. And that is in some sense, so I, th I think I, I'm with you that in particularly in popularizations of science, yeah. um, you know, ideas of this type get, get, get spread sometimes, even though if you think about them for a little bit, they're actually incoherent. Um, and, uh, and of course, a specific example is we are the outcome of nothing but genes. Genes totally control what we are. And that, that's one example, which yeah. you know far more about than I do. That's right, yeah. Exactly, that's a good example of the idea that, you know, we are, that the genes control us. Yeah. So that's a typical kind of bottom-up reductionist point of view. Yeah. That, you know, they are in you and me, they created us body, soul, and mind, and we are the sole purpose for their existence. Yes. A quote, a famous quote from the selfish gene. And so that's a, a classic reductionist picture yeah. and it's not uninteresting to realize that selfish genes is a metaphor that helps understand things but you could also turn around as Dennis Noble has done and said you know why do genes exist well genes exist because they live inside um, bodies yes. and these bodies have certain purposes including they like to reproduce which is why the genes which is the purpose correct uh, for it, uh, that that's, that's the, the, the ultimate purpose for the gene and the point is that not, neither of those two perspectives can is the only way of thinking about things they're both yeah. complementary ways of thinking about things so in some sense the top down what you're I think what if I understood you right this top down picture is a corrective to the naive popularizations I, I'm of, yeah. Of, of something that's worked pretty well in science. I, I'm not denying the bottom-up thing, and, and one should pursue the bottom-up thing as far as one can, yeah. but I'm trying to correct um, this viewpoint. And, and, and many of my very distinguished colleagues say that um, it's, it's, it's what I'm talking about is not really the way things are, it's all just appearance, it's really bottom-up, but anyhow. Yeah.